Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Gilmartin, and it's my privilege to welcome you on behalf of the uh, Board of Directors and the ECCL's uh, Executive Management Team to our 201st meeting of the ECCL. Time goes by. Uh, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate your time and your interest. We are accepting questions during the course of the, the meeting. At the end of each speaker's comments, I'll ask her some questions. We will try to answer as many questions as possible, but due to time limits, uh, we may have to just keep it, uh, cut it a little bit short. Uh, finally, we are recording this meeting. Uh, so you and others will be able, will be notified uh, through an email when it's on the ECCL website, and you'll be able to go in and take a look at it again, okay? So let me turn it over to Mark for a second, Mark. Thank you, Jim. Uh, let's all take a moment and reflect on all those that are affected and we've lost in this current pandemic. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, some of the folks that are going to be with us today that you see on the screen. Uh, Mary Gibbs is our guest speaker. Uh, Mary is the Village of Estero Community Development Director. Also joining us is Mark Nowitzki, you just heard him, our Chief Operating Officer. Bob Dion uh, is also on with us and he'll talk a little bit about uh, septic systems. Um, John Quinn, our Chief Financial Officer is with us and Alan Bodich, our Chief uh, Communications Officer. So let me now begin just to get started and introduce Mary. Uh, since June 8, 2015, Mary Gibbs has served as the Community Development Director of the Village of Estero. Mary manages planning, zoning, and building permitting. Her responsibilities include the development of the village's first comprehensive plan and land development code, which recently passed uh, to help guide the future growth and vision of Estero. In 2017, she was in inducted into the American Institute of Certified Planners for significant planning achievements. We're really happy to have Mary with us. Uh, she will provide uh, an update on community and building development activity in the village. Uh, we get a number of questions from people during the course of the months uh, asking us, hey, what's happening here? What's happening there? I see something going up there. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So we thought we'd ask Mary to just come in and just give us an overview of what is actually happening in Estero. And you will be able to ask Mary questions upon her uh, completion of her, her speech. So Mary, I'm gonna turn it over to you and you've got it. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jim. And um, I have not been at an ECCL meeting, so I'm, I'm excited. And I don't do a lot of Zoom speaking, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, as you mentioned, I mean, I'm really excited because the village just adopted its first land development code of its own, which was a major achievement. Uh, I think the village council has taken a very aggressive stance on getting you know, projects done and getting you know, things done, with the comprehensive plan. And we had to follow up with the land development code and it's unique to Estero. So I, I'm very proud of it and very relieved because I probably spent the past two years with doing a lot of work on that. So uh, that is on our website now. We, had, we updated our webpage um, to include the zoning map, the land development code itself, and the related ordinances and all the background documents. So if anybody's interested, I tried to send out uh, email notifications to interested parties this week uh, to let them know that uh, all the documents are online and uh, available and you can actually, you should be able to search. So instead of having to read 500 pages, if there's something in particular you're looking for, if you hit control F, the document is supposed to be searchable. So uh, that was a big relief and we're excited and moving on from there. So um, what I wanted to talk about mostly is just some of the projects that we have that are in review right now and some things that are going on, because like you said, well, people drive by and they see, you know, a, a big pile of dirt and they're like, what's going on there? So we've got a, 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 actually a couple of big projects in right now. And I think the largest one that we've got in is the um, piece of property that's out east on Corkscrew, um, Basically at the end of the village limits, it's wedged between uh, Belaterra and the preserve. 
and then um, Wildcat Run is to the west of it, and it's a 400-acre piece of property that was formerly known as Monte Cristo, but is now um, called Corkscrew Crossing. And that was a piece of property that was rezoned by the county many years ago. A uh, developer came in and wanted to make some changes to that, and that went through a, a process here at the village, and that was approved uh, about a year about a year and a half ago. Um, they have come in now, this property was sold to GL Homes, and they have come in now and submitted a development order, which is the site plan approval for the property for, uh, I think they're asking for 554 units, and it's uh, all single family. When it was approved originally, it could have been a mix of single and multifamily, um, and when GL Homes purchased it, they have reduced the units from what was approved uh, a little bit to 554, and they're just doing single family homes uh, with some lakes. So we are currently in the review of that right now. We just got it, uh, I think about a month ago. Uh, but I know there was a lot of interest from <laughs> Wildcat Run and the preserve um, and some Bellatera residents on the east to make sure that when we review it, there were certain things that were included in the stipulations for the project, such as certain buffers on Wildcat Run. And there was a lot of interest from the adjacent property owners. Uh, there's a lot of uh, wetlands on the property and they're gonna be putting uh, 200 and something acres into a conservation easement. So we are reviewing it now. If anybody's interested, um, we have the documents. We, right now we don't have our documents online because we just haven't been able to get that done yet, but we can make documents available if people are interested. So again, that's our biggest project at the moment. Um, another one that we're gonna see activity happen on very quickly is the property of that stock development purchased that is uh, on Corkscrew Road also, and it's east of the Lowe's Shopping Plaza. So it's east of Three Oaks and it's uh, west of Corkscrew Woodlands and Island Club. Um, that was, again, approved by the county many years ago for commercial zoning. And they came in and wanted to change it to a mixed use, which would have commercial and residential. So the zoning was approved for that property um, for about 300, a little over 300 uh, multifamily units and about 60,000 square foot of commercial uses, which would be in the front right on Corkscrew Road. Um, they have come in for their development orders now, so they're moving along uh, and they are getting close to getting approved. That project will be going back to Design Review Board probably uh, early March for a final approval. And then they want to start working on the commercial part of the property and then they're going to start clearing the property, putting in the buffers next to where they want to do the residential, digging out lakes. Uh, and then uh, constructing what they call the reverse frontage road, which is a road that will connect from the Lowe's Plaza over to Corkscrew Woodlands Boulevard. And then eventually there'll be a traffic light. I think uh, some people are familiar with the proposed traffic light that's needed at the Lowe's uh, at Puente Lane, which will connect across to um, our, the Arcos Avenue on the north. So Stock uh, has sent in their proportionate share for the traffic light and they want to get moving. So uh, again, that's a big project. That's a 43 acres and that'll be coming soon. So uh, if you drive by in a couple months and you see a lot of trucks out there, you'll know what's going on. Uh, we also have a project in right now that is uh, called Corkscrew Pines. There's so many corkscrew names that it's hard to keep everything straight sometimes, but this is a um, uh, part of Stony Brook and it's actually a 12 acre piece that's vacant on Corkscrew Road and it's um, east of the developed part of Stony Brook. It's a vacant piece of property over by the fire station and the school. And that was approved many years ago by the county as part of the development of regional impact. Uh, they want to make some changes to the site plan and shift some of the uses around. Uh, so they have to go back to zoning We'll be going back to planning and zoning board. We don't have a date set yet, uh, but they were approved for uh, office, uh, retail, a gas station, and a mini warehouse. Um, they want to change it a little bit because the mini warehouse that was approved looked a little bit like barracks, kind of an old style mini warehouse, and they want to make it uh, a little taller and not 
not barracks looking, so it probably would look more like the Cube Smart one and Ben Hill Griffin. And then uh, the gas station, uh, they're asking to operate 24 hours a day. So uh, we've asked them to reach out to Stony Brook because we know they're, uh, the neighbors there had some concerns at the original hearing. So if that doesn't have a, a date yet, but that is going through the process if anybody's interested. And then um, we have another proposal that's going through zoning right now that is called uh, Via Coconut. And that property is directly west across the street from Genova. So it's, uh, it's on corkscrew, but it uh, runs along Via Coconut. It's like a long kind of narrow strip of land, which we call the banjo piece of property because it looks like a banjo. Uh, and they are proposing mostly uh, multifamily apartments and a, a, some commercial and possibly a restaurant. Uh, they've been in the process for quite a while, but they're, uh, we're, we're trying to acquire some pieces up uh, if it's a corkscrew and Happy Hollow and Via Coconut. So they've been trying to acquire some extra pieces to make the commercial a little bit fuller. And that's been delaying them a little bit. So they um, have resubmitted some information and we're looking at that. Um, we don't have any date set for that either. That's gonna have to go back to planning and zoning board uh, when it's ready. Uh, but that'll be, um, you know, that'll be, remember Genova was like a U-Pick farm and then you drive by and you see Genova. So I think the Via Coconut is gonna have a similar impact. You see this vacant property, and, you know, now you're looking at like four, three to four story uh, multifamily building. So that's gonna be uh, something that I think is gonna be very obvious once it gets going. Um, you all may be aware of that there's a, a school uh, district owns property on Three Oaks and they are um, in right now for a comprehensive plan amendment um, so that they can construct the school site that's about a 70 acre piece of property uh, next to Copper Oaks and the post office on Three Oaks and um, that has been reviewed and has been to the planning and zoning board. Uh, they hit a little bump in the road because quite a few of the neighbors had a lot of comments and questions and concerns. So uh, they went back to planning and zoning board and we have, the next step would be to take it to the council, but we have not scheduled anything yet because we're trying to reach out to some of the neighbors uh, at Copper Oaks and Bellagio and we're trying to get some answers to a lot of the questions about the traffic impacts and will there be a traffic light and how they're going to stack the, um, the uh, people with the cars and the buses so that it doesn't spill out into Three Oaks. You know, things that some of the past school properties, they haven't really planned enough for the amount of vehicles. So we wanna make sure that there are no detrimental impacts to Three Oaks uh, so we've asked them to go back and do some more research and get some more answers about the stacking. And some of the things that came up at planning and zoning, there were quite a few questions. So we've taken a step back on that, trying to get these answers and meet with uh, the communities and the school district, I think wants to reach out as well, but we're just doing a, a preliminary research because there were also a lot of drainage uh, and flooding questions. So that is uh, again, not scheduled for uh, any public hearings yet. Um, but we do have scheduled for a public hearing or for a first reading at the council next week is the um, small piece of property that uh, is called the Pavich rezoning. And uh, if you look on Corkscrew Road at Happy Hollow Lane, there's a <laughs> very colorful small blue house. Uh, it's a small lot, it's less than an acre. And Joe Pavich um, purchased that property. He wants to build um, basically a real estate office and maybe a cafe. Uh, it's interesting because it's in the village center, but it's a small piece of property. So there are a lot of constraints. You can't, you know, you have to have a public kind of a public use, but it's very small site. So there's not a whole lot you can do with it. They've done the, what I think is a very nice design of the building. Uh, it's got uh, some old Florida aspects to it and they're gonna be, uh, we're gonna, we've got that scheduled Wednesday at the council, but the public hearing will be March 3rd. So uh, that'll be kind of interesting. And uh, uh, I think it's gonna be a nice addition. 
see, what else do we have? So we also have um, down on Coconut Road um, on the north side and uh, right next to El Dorado Acres, which is in the county. Uh, but this property we annexed, it was in the county and they wanted to do a small residential subdivision. It's got about 23 homes. It's called Coconut Landing. And uh, we annexed that into the village. That was the first annexation we've done. Uh, they are, uh, I think they have already started clearing and they're going to be getting their building permits uh, pretty soon. So um, it's just gonna be um, a nice little subdivision. Uh, well, like I said, 23 or 24 homes. Uh, you know, just a re regular single family subdivision. And I think that's going to be uh, uh, very attractive. We were just looking at their landscaping because we're trying to finish up their review. And so you'll be seeing something going on there soon. Um, also on Coconut Road, if you know where the Elks Club is, because that's a landmark that everybody knows where that is, right? Uh, there's a cell tower request from AT&T to construct a 149 foot cell tower on the kind of on the back of that uh, uh, Elks Club property and near that Discovery Day uh, building. So that is under staff review right now. We don't have a public hearing scheduled, but we may have a information meeting at Planning and Zoning Board uh, in, in March. So that's a tentative date. So if anybody's interested, we have asked them to reach out to the neighbors because 149 feet is pretty tall. And I know uh, some of the Pelican Landing and, and maybe the colony people uh, may you know, be affected. So we wanted to make sure that they reach out and uh, um, you know, at least get information about that so that they come to the hearings if they uh, have concerns. Let's see, what else do we have? Landing. Um, We've got a couple small projects that are under construction now at um, like Corkscrew Road on the north side over by Arcos Ave and by the Culver's, there's an auto zone that's going in. Um, and right next to that is what um, Hauk Medical uh, building that's about 18,000 square feet, two story building. Dr. Hauk is gonna have some offices in there and there'll be some other medical offices. Um, those were approved, they're, they're uh, really nicely designed, I think. And uh, we've got another medical building that's gonna be coming to Design Review Board um, on the 24th, I think it's called JDM Medical. It's on US 41, it's across from Coconut Mall. Uh, it's on Leiden Lane, so it's over by the Autumn Leaves facility. And uh, they wanna do, I think about a 10,000 square foot uh, medical office building. Again, that one is, is uh, quite attractive too. So we're seeing um, lots of little medical office kind of spin off. Uh, I think and before when we, we had like a little spurt of hotels and now it seems like we're getting more medical office. So I'm not sure you know, if that's gonna be the future trend or not, but that's what we're seeing uh, at the moment. And then we do also have um, the, uh, at the roundabout at Sandy Lane uh, or Williams Road and uh, Via Coconut, We've got the uh, DARA development that was approved for 180 apartments. It's four story. And if you drive down via Coconut, um, it's pretty large. So you can see it from a distance. It's under construction now. Uh, they're trying to get building permits for the last couple of buildings, uh, but it's a construction site. Uh, we're working with them because uh, they, they had a zoning condition uh, to help upgrade some of the landscaping on the side of the road and also in the roundabout. So we're working, uh, the village has Bruce Howard, who's a landscape architect, helping develop a pallet for the, uh, for the landscaping in the roundabout. And we're working with the Adara folks to see if they can help supplement that and have something that looks really attractive instead of you know, the roundabout right now is pretty plain. It's just kind of ugly. <laughs> so. I think it's going to look really nice. We saw some preliminary landscape plans and I think they uh, took the preliminary design to council last week and it, I think it's going to be uh, very attractive. Um, we also had a couple, uh, speaking of hotels and the ho trend for hotels, we had one that was approved over at Coconut Point by Rapallo. It's going to be a Hilton Garden Inn, four-story uh, 
it's it's almost ready for their development order, but I think, I don't know if there's financing issues. They, we haven't heard from them recently, so we're not sure uh, what's going on with that. Uh, but that was like the last hotel I think that we had pending. And uh, we also have pending this, uh, you see the vacant piece of property on the north side of Pork Street Road that is um, north of Genova. It was supposed to be at the colonnade, it was a continuing care facility. And if you watch, um, is it Wheel of Fortune or Jeopardy at night, they seem to always have a commercial on at the same time as those two shows showing that it's you know ready and it's coming soon. And so we asked them like, gee, we approved your zoning a long time ago, what's going on? And I think they have to have a certain amount of um, pre-sales to get financing because they've got, um, they've got some public financing through industrial revenue bonds. So there's certain conditions that they have to meet. And I think they're trying to reach that pre-sales level because we've got a development order in now that's basically ready to go. We're just waiting for them to um, finish it up. So I think that's, uh, that got delayed for, for financing issues. Uh, and then we've got a little bank, uh, Fifth Third Bank, that's gonna go on a vacant lot at Miramar um, Outlets over by that. Uh, there's another bank there, I think it's Wachovia. And a car wash proposal at the, in front of the Vines on US 41 north of Aldi's. Uh, and that, that's been to design review board and, and uh, they're gonna work with the neighbors because there's some concerns about the noise and, and some of those impacts. Um, so I think those are the, uh, all the projects that I could think of that are going on. There's probably a few that I've forgotten. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions about those. Okay. Uh I've got some questions. Uh, the first one is quite long, so I'm just going to read it to you. Maybe your answer will be shorter than the question. Uh, <laughs> congratulations to Ms. Ms. Gibbs, uh, Stephen, Kyle, and her staff for not only getting it done, but in an accessible, searchable format. So I'm assuming they're talking about the land code. My question, and I am neither a pickled fan nor an opponent, although I suggest that everyone attend the U.S. Open in Naples when it resumes, you will see pickleball uh, as not seen before, okay? Uh, of all of the activities that one could participate in, why was pickleball singled out for such scrutiny and control, even among racket sports, there is handball, squash, badminton, paddle balls, small tennis courts, et cetera, et cetera, to say nothing of baseball or basketball, one of Paul and others. Thank you. That's the question. Okay, well, well, first of all, let me say um, that when I, whenever I retire from here, I really want to learn pickleball because it looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> so, uh, so personally, I think pickleball would be um, a blast. Um, but the reason that we did address it in the land development code is because um, pickleball is very noisy. And so um, what we are saying in our land development code is if you've got like a new pickleball facility, that needs to go to a public hearing to get some approval because, um, you know, you, you need to look at where it's located. If it, you're located like right next to people's houses, then it could become a nuisance. So we look at as an appropriate distance from houses, um, and if not, what kind of noise attenuation are you gonna use so that you're not uh, making all your neighbors mad? Uh, so, you know, the, I learned a lot about pickleball. There are certain kinds of rackets are endorsed and quieter than others. And, and um, every pickleball one that we've had so far, we've had, uh, you know, the pickleball, people that love it, the neighbors don't like it, and you try to achieve some balance. And so in the Land Development Code, that's why we uh, say pickleball needs to have a public hearing so we can get everything out in the open and um, come up with uh, some appropriate conditions. It could be questions about lighting, hours of operation, and that type of thing. And, you know, it's just uh, noisier than, for example, maybe tennis or something. Okay, thanks, Mary. Uh, George, that was George Molo's question. He has another okay. He has another question. Uh, what's the status of the property on East Broadway? 
A few years ago, the village put up a barrier to deter whatever activity was considered inappropriate. The barrier was an efficient, cost-effective, and shutdown solution. Many thanks. Are there any plans? In the past, everything went from community gardens to uh, I can't even remember where were suggested. Thank yeah. you. Uh, and there were a lot of suggestions at the time of what to do, that the village should buy the property. Uh, and I think the village uh, purchased the 62 acres at US 41 and, and Corkshire Road instead. Uh, so there's been back and forth discussions of should the village purchase that property because it's owned by a private property owner. And as far as I know, there's no plans at this time, but you know, it, it, it might be appropriate at some point in time. I think there are a lot of there are some wetlands on the property. It might have some potential for water recharge, but you know, it, it, at this moment, I don't think there's any plans. Mary, uh, we have Rick D has asked three questions. So I'll just give you one answer and give you an exit and answer it and give you the next. Uh, I have a house on the east side of Wildcat Run. So what is the timing for us seeing actual construction in Corpse Group Crossing? Uh, don't have the exact timing, but I think they're very, um, the, they're very, the developer is very interested in getting moving soon. So I would think that by the time they get their development order and building permits that they may be wanting to construct uh, later this year. But again, that's just a wild, it's just a wild guess. Rick also asks, what is the timing of the stop light, the stop light near Lowe's and Culver's? Um, the latest I've heard on the stop light is there was a, a easement needed from Kite Construction, but the county, I understand, is already going out to do the bids and uh, the process, I think, takes about nine or 10 months because they've got to go out and do the bids and then uh, pick somebody. And then when you order the mast arm piece, which is a big piece that the light uh, attaches to, that apparently is something that takes about five months because you're just you know, in demand or something. So I, I imagine it's going to be you know, nine or 10 months. Uh, Rick's last question is, what is the plan, he says, what is planned for the property on the northeast corner of 41 and Corkscrew across from Corrison site? And that's the village property, which I, I forgot to mention because that is one of, one of the biggest projects we've got going on right now. It's 60, a little over 60 acres. Uh, we are just doing some very preliminary uh, work on it now. We've actually got... Uh, Johnson Engineering to go out and, and give us an evaluation of the wetlands um, and the wildlife because we need to know what um, we, everything that we had on that property is pretty old. So we, we need some updated surveys so we know where uh, the uh, champion trees and the heritage trees, we want to know where everything's located so we can see what constraints there are. And then we've got um, Canaan Associates from Orlando was helping us. I think we had a series of Zoom meetings to try to get citizens input on what they would like to see on the property. So we're still looking at um, you know, what would we do with the south side of the property? Is that more suited for kind of environmental purposes or preserves or you know, some suggestions we got were like doing it like um, Naples where they had some sort of floodway protections incorporated into park area. And do we want to do have more intensive development on the north side of the property that was already agricultural, pretty scraped over? It doesn't really have that environmental benefit. And it, you know, maybe we do something there so that we would could recoup some of the cost of the property and pay off the debt. But again, it's very preliminary. Um, other than having Canaan Associates look at it, we we're still just trying to get some ideas of what want to do and what people would like to see there. Okay, uh, Donna Sutton has a question. I looked at the proposed landscape upgrade in the roundabout. The crosswalks look like they are still the same as current. The current ones are hazardous and designed due to the sharp, narrow 
as designed due to the sharp, narrow 90 degree angle. Uh, can that be changed? Uh, also, is the multi-use path along Williams going to connect there and feed to the same roundabout crossing? Uh, okay, well now I'm not, not quite the person, that's more of our public works, David Williams, but I know when we looked at the landscaping, uh, I thought they talked about, uh, Bruce Howard was going to recommend that we do something with the, the crosswalks because uh, I don't think they're elevated and it doesn't connect. So I believe they were also looking at the whole picture besides the landscaping, trying to make it more useful. Because right now it's, if you ride your bike or anything down there, it's, it's you know, conducive to people using it, only cars. Okay. Uh, the next is from uh, Patrita Shifo. Uh, any information on the old Wind Dixie site on Imperial and Coconut Road, that's Three Oaks Coconut. Uh, the Wind Dixie site is um, there's a proposal in to um, basically tear down the Wind Dixie building itself, leave the rest of the shopping center there, but just take down the Wind Dixie building and then redevelop that parking lot area and the Wind Dixie into uh, apartments. I think the proposal is about 150 apartment unit building about uh, four stories tall. Uh, and that is, um, there's a lawsuit on that right now, so I can't really talk about that. But that, that's the proposal that is, yeah. Um, Brian Hurwitz has a question. Property development next to Stony Brook, he's interested in. Uh, Grandeza across the road uh, on Corkscrew. Gas station, other commercial enterprises will impact us. Grandeza should be included in discussion. It's more of a comment than a question. Here, here's a question. How does this development impact the public school? Uh, and we did ask, just as an aside, we did ask the developers to meet with uh, Stony Brook and Grandeza because there could be um, some visual impacts on Grandeza depending on where they locate the mini warehouse and how tall it is. There, the, um, one of the things they talked about uh, with this project is trying to find a way to make the, uh, the access so that it would be better for the school. And there were a few meetings with the school district to see if they could find a better way to route the traffic in and out and help make the school situation a little bit better. But I don't know that that has actually come to fruition. I know there were preliminary talks. But what I heard lately is I'm not sure that that we have a solution for that. We're trying to get everybody to work together so that it would be um, an improvement. Okay, uh, it looks like we have the last question here and it's from uh, Al Leckberg. Uh, what happened, um, it's a little mixed up a bit here. What happened to something would not allow a shovel to go in the ground until the light goes up? Uh, this was your promise to Island Club and Corkscrew Woodlands. What changed the board's mind? Do you understand that? Yeah, I know what that yeah. question is. That was um, when the zoning was approved for stair crossing, there was a condition that the um, traffic light had to be in and be operational before um, stock could start construction of the buildings. And they came back and initially stock was gonna work with the county to help do the traffic light design. And it was all supposed to come together and be done by now. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, it wasn't really stock's fault, but I think the county, uh, you know, was just trying to get the agreement done and it just got to, ended up getting delayed. So stock came back and said, we want to pay our proportionate share for the traffic light. You know, we want to pay our money, but we want to be able to at least start construction so that the timing of the signal, uh, so they could get working on things. And then uh, theoretically the signal would be done about the time they get ready to open a couple of the commercial buildings. So they went back to the council and it was very contentious because I know the neighbors felt that, uh, you know, the light needed to be operational, but if you, we 
there is a legal question if you take somebody's proportionate share and you don't let them build, you know, will you get sued for that? And also we wanted to get that reverse um, frontage road constructed because that's gonna help funnel out some of the traffic. So the council had a long discussion. It was very contentious, but they said, yes, let's get the proportionate share. We wanna get this traffic light expedited as much as we can. We don't control it because it's the county, but we've already paid for the design ourselves. So we wanna get this thing moving. And that's what happened. And I'm hoping that now that the county has gone out to do the bids that it will get done. And I stock by the time they get ready to open a building, I'm hoping that the, that the light will be close to being operational. Um, okay, Al has one other question. Where does the Estero property east end east on Corkscrew Road? Um, just before it, at Bellaterra is the last property and then to the east, just directly east in the county is that um, corkscrew, uh, can't think of the name of it. Corkscrew Shores. Corkscrew Shores, thank you, Mark. I'm like, yes. Oh. <laughs> that, and yeah. a lot of people think that's in Estero, but that's actually in the county. Okay. Um, that's the last of the questions that we have. I appreciate the answers, straightforward answers. Um, I think we're going to have to move on. Um, uh, you can stay with us, Mary, if you like. If you, if you need to move on to some other things, we understand that. Uh, we will be going through some of uh, what's going on in ECCL and, and the kinds of issues we're going to be dealing with over the next several years. Yeah, if you don't mind, I think I'm, I'm going to jump off because I've got another meeting that's coming up. We understand and we do appreciate you showing up, Mary. Thanks again for your comments and uh, for your Thank enlightenment you. for a lot of the information that's taking okay. place. Thanks very okay. much. Thanks, Mary. Bye. Thanks. Okay. Well, I have to say there is another question. Looks like, let me just see this and I doubt if we can answer it, but uh, if we can't, well, they can go back. No, that was it. I, I think I captured all of them. I think I'm looking just one more time. I think that that's really it that I have that shows up here. And candidly, she drew the most questions of any speaker we've had uh, while since we were doing the Zoom meetings and that started in the early part of 2020. So people are really interested in what's taking place and, and they have the opportunity to asked directly to the person who knows about it rather than any kind of a filter. And that was the reason we decided to ask Mary and she was gracious enough to take the time and talk with us, okay? So let me talk to you a little bit about the ECCL, what's going on with it. I'm just gonna reiterate a, a couple of issues that I think are important. And that is number one, the strategic plan for the ECCL. We mentioned it uh, at the last meeting that the ECCL's executive management team uh, uh, formed a strategic thinking planning committee and that committee came, and that was in the summer of 2020. And they came back with a significant amount of information. A lot of work was done on it. And as a result, uh, the EMT suggested to the board, recommended to the board, about six key issues that the ECCL should be focusing on over the next five years or so. And uh, those issues were improving water quality, improving community health, increasing safety, which would include transportation safety issues, promote culture and recreation, promote greater sterile area schools, and support economic growth. Um, to achieve progress on these issues, uh, we are attempting to form coalitions of other interested parties and groups around those particular issues. We believe it's in the best interest of Estero uh, to have the ECCL be a part of a larger group and increase the volume of their voice uh, to take a position uh, on various issues. Uh, hopefully most of it will be to support where the community wants us to go. And we're gonna be moving on in that direction. If you out there uh, are interested in uh, participating in these activities, or you know other people you think would be good to participate 
in any of those areas I just shared, uh, please contact me at ECCLPRES at gmail.com or call me at 630-337-9900. I'll be happy to talk with you and get you to the right people within our organization that can you can join and move ahead on these issues. As also mentioned at the last meeting, the ECCL board approved management's recommendation to apply to the IRS to change um, its designation from a 501c4 organization to a 501c3 designation. And the board also recently approved requisite changes to the ECCL bylaws. We had to make changes to the bylaws for a variety of internal organizational issues and a significant amount of changes that had to meet the criteria of the IRS to, uh, to give us a designation of a 501c3 organization. As I mentioned last time again, a 501c3 organization will give the ECCL some significant opportunities and advantages that we don't have now. Um, a 501c3 is a nonprofit organization it's qualified to receive contributions, donations from people, and that, in that those donations are tax deductible for the kinds of things we want to accomplish where we need some funding in, in those top areas we talked about earlier. Some of the advantages basically are, we, we will be able to self-manage our organization, our foundation. We currently have a 501c3 foundation but it's managed by the Southwest Florida Community Foundation. Uh, they're doing a good job, nothing wrong with that, but uh, we plan on taking it back and putting it into the 501c3 that we are going to establish, which would be the ECCL. We have much better chance of managing it. Uh, we will be more eligible for grants, have access to those. We'll control the investment management ourselves. We'll improve the public image because a 501c3 provides an intrinsic advantage when presenting uh, the organization, the ECCL in this case, to the public as a nonpartisan, non-political organization, which is what we are. Uh, and there are short and long range legal and tax and funding advantages I won't go into at this point, okay? So the board has approved, as I said, bylaws necessary for the applications. Shortly, we will schedule a Zoom meeting for member representatives uh, uh, to vote uh, and approve the bylaw changes. There will be an opportunity to ask questions, and I said vote on the bylaw changes. The bylaws require two thirds approval of those participating in the Zoom meeting for passage. That's it. Whoever shows up for that Zoom meeting, two thirds we're looking for to approve it. The board and the executive management team spent a significant amount of time on this, and we really uh, are highly recommending approval. So stand by. Uh, uh, shortly, we'll be reaching out to the uh, various par, uh, representatives in our member group and set this up and then get that passed. And then once that takes place, there are a few other pieces we have to put together. Uh, and then John will make an app, John Quinn will make an application to the IRS to get us a 501c3 designation. Are there any questions or comments on, on that particular area? Anybody want any clarification on that? or any comments about it? Okay, I'll pass on that. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mark now. Mark, any comments you have? Uh, just just a couple quick ones. The, uh, the Veterans Recognition Pocket Park Committee of the Culture and Recreation uh, Council will meet in person on February the 18th at 3.30 at the Estero Historical Society deck. Bring your own chair. If you're interested, uh, let me know or Rosalind. On the education side, Amy Kugenbecker and Jen McLeod are back on Zoom in the classroom teaching junior achievement. You know, it's been about a year and a half since we've been even any um, learning teaching in the, in the classroom. We, uh, the ECCL joined the Estero Chamber and the Estero Historical Society to uh, work with Estero High School to offer three scholarships, one for history, one for governance, and one for business. If you're interested in helping us judge those essays when they come in, uh, let myself or Rosalind know. And lastly, we've got a transportation Google Meet next Thursday at noon on the 18th. 
um, to talk about how we're kind of evolving the transportation and the safety and transportation and other things. If, uh, if you need the, uh, the invite, let me know. Thanks, Jim. Okay, any questions of Mark at all um, about what he spoke about or anything on your mind? Okay. Uh, okay, next I'd like to introduce Bob Dion. Um, Bob uh, raised his hand at one of our meetings uh, and said, in effect, you know, I'm really interested in the septic issue, you know, the environmental side of, of what we do. And I, I think I can lend some uh, expertise, uh, advice, and experience in this whole issue. And uh, I'm sure most of you who are on this, on this um, Zoom meeting today are familiar with uh, the fact that we are really trying to do our best to clean up the water. That's what I mentioned earlier. We'll do whatever we can. There are a number of groups you all know that are involved in water. Uh, clarity, water cleaning up water uh, issues. Um, the ECCL wants to be in, in, involved in that and sort of be uh, looking over the, 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 side, the shoulders of those folks who are involved in the village and et cetera and Lee County to do what uh, we can to support and motivate and encourage more activity to clean up our water. We are not experts in that. We don't pretend to be experts in that but we do have a capacity to communicate to the residents and other uh, businesses within the greater Estero area about this, this issue. And it's, it's, it's taking steps. When you look to make major change from our perspective, it's a step process. You take small bites and you take care of this and you keep going, you look for low hanging fruit and you, you take, make things happen. So, uh, Again, Bob has uh, uh, volunteered to work with us on this. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to him and he'll give you some observations, some early observations and findings. So Bob, I'll, it's all yours. Thank, thank you, Jim. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction and I'm honored and excited about uh, joining the ECCL and making a difference. I, I'm certain that uh, I'd be able to make a difference uh, in water quality in the Estero River in working with the, uh, the village uh, staff and management, uh, which it really is the key to getting this uh, done. The village is really uh, the key uh, organization. Um, just a general note, we, we know that the Estero River is impaired with bacteria. Uh, some or most of it is from human waste. Uh, so, and, and yet at the same time, the Estero River is considered an outstanding Florida water, outstanding Florida water and we're polluted. So it's disappointing to see that. And I don't think anyone would disagree that we want to change that. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have a lot of people looking to do uh, some good in that area. Uh, I've been an advocate for the Estero River for some time now, and I've spoken at, uh, the village council meetings uh, from time to time, as Mary mentioned earlier. Um, and I love boating, fishing, the outside, the out outdoors, uh, and I love the Estero River. It's a beautiful river and we want to improve it. Uh, I am a member of the Calusa Waterkeeper Organization and in Pelican Sound Golf and River Club, a member of the Watercraft and River Committee, where we deal with river issues and watercraft issues and some little projects and some bigger ones that we uh, we we advocate for. And again, I, I've spoken at uh, many of the village council meetings. Uh, this uh, this past week after I met with Tim and Mark, uh, I was encouraged to go forward and, and work on this uh, with the UCCL uh, backing. And I did talk to um, Kyle, a staff member at the village, uh, where I went over the whole idea of what, what is the village doing uh, about this and um, pretty comprehensive uh, thoughts there in terms of uh, straightening out and converting septic to sewer. Uh, I mentioned also to him at, at the meeting and brought a copy of 
uh, the news article about uh, the governor's proposal for $100 million to be uh, budgeted for uh, septic to sewer conversions. Hopefully that gets approved and we certainly will need a piece of that naturally to, uh, to go forward. Uh, and the other point, we all would love, I'd love to be able to flip a switch and correct the whole thing. We know that's not gonna happen. It's gonna take some time and effort to go through a whole process. And I can present that information to you, Jim, uh, as to what uh, Kyle had mentioned, what the plans are. Um, in the meantime, I don't know if we uh, should be looking to inspect the current septic systems uh, to see which ones are uh, possible pollutants uh, to the Estero River. But I'm working through that and I'll, I'll be talking to Mary, uh, hopefully sometime next week, uh, to talk about, you know, what do we do with the existing septic systems prior to them being converted. So again, I'm working on this. I'm uh, very confident that we're gonna be getting some results over time. And I appreciate the opportunity of being here. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Thank you, Bob. That's really good. Uh, and we do appreciate you raising your hand. I guess people out there are going to want to, are going to be very, very cautious about doing this uh, <laughs> in the future. But, no, I love it. Uh, but listen, we, we recognize people who are interested, have a civic interest and want to be civically engaged. And that's terrific. And we, we welcome you. Um, are there any questions for Bob from the, for those of you who are out there? Anything at all about the issue Bob talked about, that's the septic systems to begin with in cleaning up uh, the Estero River. Okay, great. So uh, let me introduce then John Quinn. Uh, John will give us a, a summary of our financial situation as we usually do every meeting. John? Thank you. The um, dues had been invoiced out in January uh, we've received in uh, 26 of 39 um, so far. Our income this past year, past month, was a total of $15,440. Less the expenses, we've added $13,800 to our funds. Now, these funds have to last all year long. So uh, we have to nurture our spending, uh, but we have a plan that's been approved by the Board of Directors and um, we hope to implement some significant spending in areas to support the ECCL. Uh, we look forward to um, collecting the rest of the member dues and also adding to the additional members into the organization. Um, the current balance in hand is $33,000, which is compared to prior years, significant. However, we have a great deal of things to do and numbers of challenges coming up. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thanks, John. You, you just reminded me of uh, the issue of membership and I, I just wanna make a quick uh, comment about it. Um, Barry Friedman is available to talk to us today, but uh, we, we have really looked at and have been encouraged by the board to look at how we can improve uh, our finances uh, going down the road. A, a, a number of these issues that we raised um, are going to call for uh, additional funds uh, that the ECCL is, is going to need. Membership is going to help us to get those funds. By increasing our members, we'll, we'll be able to build up uh, a, a fund that will be there as we need it. And the effort is going to be a really quite extensive to reach out to a variety of organizations, both residencies and business commercial organizations in the greater Estero area to join the ECCL. Uh, we think it'll bring us not only funds, but it will bring us people that we're not in touch with now who are interested in civic engagement and want to get involved with the ECCL to do the best we can um, to see that the, the, EC, that the village or the greater Estero area is the 
is a destination area, destination area where people really want to come and visit, uh, work, play. Uh, and if that's the kind of thing that we need to do to make us move forward uh, or give us the, the substance we need to move forward uh, and accomplish the kind of goals that the ECCL has. So membership is going to be a big issue and we're going to be, you'll see more and more of it as we develop our approach to it. So on that, I'll turn this over now to um, Alan Bodich. And Alan, any thoughts on your side? <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Jim, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, Jim, you said earlier um, about the development, of course, of the ECCL's strategic plan and its focus for the future. Uh, while up to date, uh, much of that information, of course, has been discussed internally, uh, we recognize the need to make sure that people who uh, know the ECCL and, and understand what we do uh, are more aware of what our future commitments are going to be. So uh, during the next uh, week or, or 10 days, uh, we will be sending out uh, a communication that identifies uh, exactly what our future focus will be. In, in other words, our strategic aims. And so uh, do please keep a lookout for that communication piece uh, which will be emailed to everyone and also put on the website. I think it's important for everybody to have a good understanding of, of what our aims are, given all the many things that have happened uh, in the past by the, the uh, ECCL and the impact that the ECCL has made on the greater Estero area. Some people might be wondering, well, what comes next? This is the, uh, the uh, answer and we hope you all read it very carefully. So that's important. Uh, a couple of other things. Um, we recognize that with our focus on safety and health, um, there are a number of things that we need to do to help people better understand some of the issues that surround these topics. Um, we have also uh, in, in the work, so to speak, uh, a communication about the, the value of AEDs and how to use those safely uh, if you experience somebody who has a heart attack and um, our own um, health group within the ECCL has prepared an article which will be released soon uh, on that topic. And given now that many people have been, um, of course, receiving uh, COVID vaccination, either their first dose or their second dose, uh, we feel that there's some other important information that people who've gone through this process, which of course is an extremely important step, uh, also need to know going forward. And we'll be communicating uh, another short piece about things to be careful of even after uh, you've actually received the COVID vaccine. Uh, just earlier on this month, we, re we released the first of four uh, special reports that we plan to do each year, which are called the Greater Estero Community Reports. And in the first one, which was released a short time ago, uh, we talked about the uh, impact and the, and the extent of work that's being done on global warming on a local basis, uh, together with the things that the ECCL has been involved with uh, on the teaching and the school side, including, of course, the important work that uh, Mark Nowitzki also mentioned on the uh, Junior Achievement Awards, and also the very kind help that we received from uh, Estero High School on the designs that were put forward by the students there uh, for the proposed Pocket Park. So those are some of the uh, important things that are both coming and have been done uh, on the communication side this month. Thank you, Jim. Thanks very much, Alan. Uh, are there any questions for Alan? Anything on the issues he's talked about? Okay, thanks. There is one other question. Frank Moser asks, how many persons are attending the ECCL meeting? Uh, hi, Frank. Uh, we're about 42 right now. Uh, and typically what happens, uh, I'll share this with you, typically what happens is we have anywhere between, I'd say 35 to 45 people typically uh, attend this meeting, participate and get engaged in, in these Zoom meetings. Uh, we recognize that 
uh, it's not as much as you typically found when we went to the park district and people came in, people love to get to talk to one another, see one another. It's a, it's a whole different uh, ball of wax and we recognize that. So we're happy that the folks who are signing up and watching this are doing so. We appreciate that very much. So it's about 42, Frank. Uh, and what happens is since we record it, uh, we can track how many people go in and open it up and watch the video. And that usually is several hundred every time we have a meeting. So we've actually expanded the, um, the audience for the ECCL meetings, uh, but they do it at their own time. It's at their leisure, which is great. Uh, the only disadvantage they have is that they uh, don't have an opportunity to uh, ask any questions and so on. However, you know, they, they know where we are. And if the, if the meetings spark some questions, you know, they can pick up the phone and call us. They can email us. They can find our, or anyone that's here, our email address is online. Uh, when you just go into the organization. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something we look forward to in terms of moving away from Zoom and getting into the real world again and touching the flesh. That's something we really uh, look forward to doing. But in the meantime, we're stuck with this. So uh, like most people, we're just going to have to deal with it. And again, we, we appreciate you showing up and sharing uh, your thoughts with us. Um, so we're getting close to wrapping it up, but I'll offer the other the last opportunity to answer any questions whatsoever that may be on your mind out there. Um, uh, if you have some, please jot them down, let me know, and I'll pull them up. Okay, we have somebody raised his hand. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, it disappeared. Um, let me see, just give me a second, give me a second, give me a second. I think I saw, oh, here you go. Okay, Bob Lenish has something to say, so I'm going to unmute you, Bob. Uh, let us know what you have to say. Well, good morning, Jim, and thank you for allowing me an opportunity to bring the members up to date on one important issue, I think, that affects about a third of the members. And I'm referring to the members who are served by the Benita Springs Utilities Organization. There are uh, elections that are coming up. One third of their board turns over every year. For the past year, no one from Estero has been on the board of the Benita Springs Utilities. We have an opportunity with the upcoming ballots, which will be mailed next week, to vote for one, actually three of 10 very qualified candidates. I think almost all the candidates are well qualified. Fortunately or unfortunately, three of the candidates are incumbents. And the history with the Benita Springs Utilities has always been that the incumbents get reelected. One of the people that is on the ballot this year is the only person from Estero out of the 10, and that is our current mayor, Bill Ribble. Many of you may be aware of the fact that uh, Bill is going off the uh, Estero Village Council. He's being termed out in March. He's been on that council for six years and has done a great job. Personally, I think he's a wonderful man. But in any event, there are 10 very, very good candidates on the uh, ballot. And I encourage everyone to look at the ballots and go to bsu.us to look at their qualifications. That's all I had to say, Jim. Thank you for giving okay. me Okay. Uh, oh, thanks, Bob. Appreciate that. Um, uh, the ECCL will be sending out an email blast on this particular issue, encouraging people to take a hard look at the folks that are running for the BSU board. Uh, that's important to us, as Bob said. Uh, we, the southern part of Estero, is, is managed by the BSU, the Benita Springs Utilities, and and as he said, there are no uh, representatives from Estero uh, at the moment. So take a hard look at those representatives and do your, do, your, do your civic duty and vote, okay? Okay, I think that's really it. Um, thanks for joining us today, folks. A special thanks to Mary Gibbs. We really appreciate her showing up. I think she did a great job, answered all the questions. 
And also to all of you who participated and were engaged in the meeting, we really appreciate that as well. We hope you, we, you got what you hoped you get out of the meeting. So uh, on behalf of the board of directors and the executive management team uh, and our council chairs, thanks again for your time and civic engagement. We really appreciate it. Uh, the meeting is now adjourned.